store for today. I am honored that uh, Pastor Tom would entrust uh, this platform to me. As a senior pastor, I know that uh, you value this, and I am so thankful to get to serve alongside uh, an amazing man of God who uh, rightly divides God's worth and faithfulness and truth each week. I'm humbled by his leadership, uh, by his preaching, and uh, I'm so thankful to call him a friend. So, Pastor Tom, we're praying for you, and we uh, look for you to get back safely. So, if you got your Bibles today, and I hope you do, either turn in your Bible or turn on your Bible to Psalm chapter 1. That's where we're going to spend our time together today in Psalm 1. And I want to talk to you for just a few minutes today on the title or the subject, if you will, of it's not over just because you feel under. I believe that Christians and unbelievers alike, the spiritually mature and the spiritually undeveloped, all can experience seasons of life where they go through difficulty or challenge, seasons of life where they feel under. You know what these are like. Many of you have experienced seasons where no matter how hard you try or how hard you work or how organized or disciplined you try to be, man, you just can't seem to get ahead. You struggle. Maybe you seek God's guidance or wisdom in a particular situation and you have a hard time physically seeing a solution or a way out. You continue to struggle to think that you're going to make it, that things really are going to work out for your good. You have a hard time believing that your situation is going to get any better. Many of you in this room can testify this morning to seasons of life where you feel like, man, you're under. Many people feel under pressure, deadlines, and other people's expectations got them stressed out. Some people feel under depression. They're tired, tired of the way things are. They don't see any physical way out. Many people feel undervalued. They really wish someone could just recognize their potential. Others feel under attack, like someone is out to get them, like everything wants them to fail, like life is against them. Others perhaps feel underestimated. They feel overlooked by the world and by people of importance. Many feel underpaid. Where are my underpaid people at in the room, right? You feel like you work to make someone else rich, right? And you deserve more for what you do. Many people feel underappreciated, like no one really appreciates or values all that you do, and maybe you should just quit. Some feel underqualified. Like if you could just get that opportunity to prove yourself, then you would show them. Many feel under-equipped, like they haven't received the same opportunities or the same resources as other people. Some feel under-empowered, like if they could just get that position with the power to do something about it, then they would make a difference. Then they would feel fulfilled. Then they would be happy. Many times in life when we feel under when we go through this season of life and we face these types of challenges, we feel like we're kind of buried there. We feel like it's over. But I'm here today to tell you that it's not over just because you feel under. In fact, you're not under. You're not buried. In Christ this morning, I believe that you're simply planted. Psalm chapter 1, verse 1. Blessed is the man who does not walk in the counsel of the wicked, or stand in the way of sinners, or sit in the seat of mockers. But his delight is in the law of the Lord, and on his law he meditates day and night. He is like a tree planted by streams of water, which yields its fruit in season, and whose leaf does not wither. Whatever he does prospers. Not so the wicked... They are like chaff that the wind blows away. Therefore, the wicked will not stand in the judgment, nor sinners in the assembly of the righteous. For the Lord watches over the way of the righteous, but the way of the wicked will perish. Would you pray with me? Heavenly Father, God, you are the reason why we are here. God, we gather in your house to hear from you. Lord, we long for your presence. We're so thankful, God, that you are with us. God, we pray that you are highly exalted. I pray for every person in the room. God, I pray that your spirit would renew us. God, would strengthen us, would challenge us in your word. If there be anyone here today that's far from you or doesn't know you, that has not transferred their trust in the saving 
grace of Jesus Christ, Lord, I pray that today would be the day, Lord, that they receive life in your name. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Psalm is a beautiful work of art, a beautiful book that's not only God-inspired, God-breathed words for life, but it's also inspired many hymns of praise and worship and adoration to our God. For centuries, the Psalms has not just been read, but they are sung and they're uttered and they're repeated all in worship services all over our world across different denominations and, and religious backgrounds. For generations from the first century on, the Psalm even before, and the psalm has been used in many different ways to bring glory and honor to God and encouragement to God's people. We often attribute King David to many of the psalms. He's attributed to 73 out of the 150 psalms here in Psalm. But in Psalm 1, there's no clear identity for authorship here. But this great introduction to this magnificent book is filled with as much anticipation as your favorite author's brand new series release. You know, even better than that murder mystery or that sinister romantic novel that just takes your mind to foreign places and builds climactic scenes of great theatrical suspense filled with deep excitement and anticipation for how the story's going to unfold. Yeah, Psalm 1 does that here. The introduction of Psalm lays out two competing characters. These characters have clearly established positions and are at warring factions with one another. These characters have very different frameworks for their existence and transpired a very different endings. Here we have the wicked and the righteous. Author begins verse 1 by saying, Blessed is the man who does not walk in the counsel of the wicked or stand in the way of sinners, or sit in the seat of mockers. The idea of blessed here is literally translated to mean blessedness or happiness. It's a state of being. It's a state of existence. Not as much the blessing that comes as like a gift from God for life, but it's a state of existence for the believer who's rooted in God's Word, who delights in the way of God. You're going to see in verse 2, it's a state of, of life. It's a state of being blessed or being happy. It's not just a physical gift that comes like a blessing from God for life. If you'll notice in verse 1, there's a great progression of sin and depravity for the wicked. Blessed is the man who does not walk in the counsel of the wicked. The idea of walking is that there's movement. There's a place where you're in one position and you're walking toward the counsel of the wicked, toward the advice of wicked people, of people who do not seek God, who do not seek after his word, who do not seek his will or obey his law, walking in the counsel of the wicked. There's movement. But if you look on there at the end of verse 1, who does not walk in the counsel of the wicked or stand in the way of sinners. There's no more movement. They're not, no longer walking in the counsel of the wicked. They're actually standing. They're taking their stance with sinful men. They're taking their position in the path of sinful people. There's no movement. Now they have standed. They are taking their spot. And if you notice, even worse, who does not walk in the counsel of the wicked or stand in the way of sinners or sit in the seat of mockers. Man, in life, for those who live and breathe oxygen in this life, man, we are born into sin and depravity. We are born into a condition, the Bible says, we are dead in our trespasses and sins. And you see this great progression here. Many of you know that sin, you've heard so many times before, man, it takes you so much further than you ever intended to go. It keeps you so much longer than you ever intended to stay. And here we see how sin can transpire over the course of life from walking to standing to sitting. Man, they are, they are just set in their ways. You know people like this. Man, they are just seated in the seat of mockers. They're cynical, curmudgingly old, mean people, right? You know people like this. Some of you know one like that in here, right? <laughs> just kidding a little. Verse 2, but his delight is in the law of the Lord, and on his law he meditates day and night. I want you to notice here in this verse, in verse 2, uh, the delight of the righteous is in the law of the Lord. His delight leads to meditation. His, the right attitude leads to the right action. 
You see here, delighting in something leads to meditating in it. Delighting in the law of God leads to meditating in His Word. If I delight in my spouse and in my family, then I want to spend time with them. The things that you delight in, wherever your heart is, your treasure will be there also. So the things in this life that get your delight, the things that get your affection and your attention, those are the things you're going to give your time to. Those are the things you're going to give your talent to, your treasure to. And so my question for you and for myself as we reflect on God's Word today, man, Where's your delight? Here we see that the one who's the righteous, the one who the Bible's talking about, blessed is the man who delights in the law of God. The right attitude leads to the right action. Delight. Verse 3, and this is my absolute favorite. This is the actual application point, I think, for this message. This is our illustration comes from the text today. He is like a tree. He is like a tree planted by streams of water. Now, the author here used great simile to compare the life of the righteous to a tree. Now, I love trees. I love them. This time of year, getting close, if we ever have fall, I'm not sure if we will or not, but if we ever have fall, this is where everything cools off and the leaves start to turn and it gets really pretty outside and you get to wear a jacket and not sweat on Sunday morning. It's a great time, right? I love fall. But if you notice here, this tree, right, and all trees, they don't really start out as trees. Unless you, like, graft them, right? We won't get into all that. But a tree is started out as a seed that's planted under the earth. Trees do not simply produce fruit in their first year of growth. In fact, the oak tree, which is one of my favorite, uh, takes 20 to 30 years before it matures and starts to produce acorns, right? 20 to 30 years, there's a tree called the Chinese bamboo tree. It starts out as a seed about the size of a walnut, and you plant it, and the gardener, man, he must water it and fertilize it every day for five years. And in five years of watering this tree and fertilizing this tree, there's no breakthrough growth on the surface. If any point over the course of five years the, the gardener fails to tend to the tree, then it will die. But in the fifth year, the Chinese bamboo tree grows 90 feet tall in six weeks. Six weeks. What a great testament to our lives and our perseverance of the Christian journey in faith through our God. Before trees can demonstrate any growth above the surface, right, where people can see it, we must first grow deep roots underground that can support the growth of the tree. Think of this, right? Right? Underground, immediately there's darkness. There's no initial growth. The place of being planted and the place of being buried appears the same for a season. The place of death and the place of destiny look the same for a while. The difference is what's inside the object that's under. You take a coin, you take money, you bury it in the ground. Nothing happens over time. It diminishes and fades away. You take any inanimate object and you bury it in the ground and it simply depletes and diminishes over time. But a seed with life inside of it sprouts forth roots and begins to grow. The roots begin to grow deep, creating a support system for the tree that will provide both nutrients from the soil required for growth and protection from the storms that will most certainly bring stress and pressure to the tree. These are the difficult seasons of life for us when we feel like we're going under. We don't realize that the deep darkness that leads us to feeling forgotten and worthless will only be used to strengthen and support the great beauty and growth that one day God will use to display for all the world to grow richment from. The tree planted by streams of water is always connected to its source of life. You see, it need not require outside interference to provide life or nourishment for it. It need not uh, depend on what's going on in the atmosphere to provide life for it. It need not depend on an outside source to give life to it or to water it for, for health or for homeostasis. In fact, the tree in our text here does not even lose its leaves, whose leaf does not wither. 
You know, most trees, this time we talked about fall, they, they turn and they're pretty and they're beautiful, and we like to go up and see them in Gatlinburg and Mentone, right, if you're from Scottsboro or whatever. But all from those different areas, right, where we go see this beauty thing happen, what's really happening, these trees experience a process called abscission. It's the same root word we get the word scissors from. It means to cut, right? The tree will literally cut off supply of water to its leaves, to its limbs, so that it can reserve it for itself, that it might survive the harsh winter, the difficult weather, the harsh climate that it's going to endure. But not our tree. Our tree holds nothing back. Our tree allows the waters of the streams of life to flow freely to all its branches in every season so that its leaves never wither and its fruit is produced in due season. The author says about this type of person or this type of tree, whatever he does prospers. Whatever he does prospers. Jeremiah gives his rendition of this text. He says, blessed is the man who trusts in the Lord, whose confidence is in him. He will be like a tree planted by the water that sends out its roots by the stream. It does not fear when heat comes. It, its leaves are always green. It has no worries in a year of drought and never fails to bear fruit. Man, in our lives, we, as Christians, as believers in Christ, man, we are so connected to the source of life that we must understand that although we go through seasons of life where we feel extreme difficulty, when we feel extreme pressure, we feel like, man, we're going under, like we're not going to make it. We just, we're not sure how it's going to work out. We, we trust God and we believe Him, but we have a hard time seeing a solution or a way out. Man, we, I want someone to understand today that it's not over just because you feel under. You know, my wife and I, we've been married seven years. Praise God, it's been a great, wonderful, challenging ride of life, right? Those of you that are married in the room, you know exactly what I'm talking about. It's been great. But now we got married uh, one week, and then I literally started a position at a church the next week, right? I was an associate pastor, and I was over students, and I was working uh, bivocationally. I built airplane windshields full-time as well at the time. It was a nightmare. It was crazy. But God worked at this thing in our lives, and we were able to continue on and go into full-time ministry. And I got called over to Scottsboro, Alabama to be their student pastor. And we're plugging along, and we're struggling in marriage and figuring each other out and all that stuff. And then we get tragedy. We get the news, the report that no one wants to hear. We get that doctor's report that nobody likes. At 24 years old, my beautiful wife of just a couple years is diagnosed with a rare form of bone cancer in her hip socket. We knew that God did not, was not surprised by this, but it was very painful. It was very difficult to walk through, especially for her. She was an avid runner. She loved running. She loved exercise and fitness, and the doctors told her the surgery was very extensive. They told her she would probably never be able to run again, and because of the radiation, they would shoot to the, to the abdominal area. It could potentially damage her female reproductive organs, and possibly she would not be able to have children or to, or to or bear children, and so if, for a young married couple, it's very stressful. It's very difficult, and you feel like you're going under, like you're not going to make it, like you're not going to overcome, and five years ago, we went through all this process, and we go through uh, this, this surgery and radiation and treatment, and in April of 2014, we finished the last round. She rung the gong at MD Anderson, and in April 2019, five years later, God has planted a seed, and he has given us life, and we'll give birth to our firstborn child. It's not over just because you feel under. Our God is a mighty God. Verse 4 says, not so with the wicked. They are like chaff that the wind blows away. Literally, the word there is referring to like um, uh, some grain that would fall to the ground and be blown away by the wind to find no soil, to take no root, having its very life stripped from it. The wicked will not stand, verse 5, in the judgment, nor sinners in the assembly of the righteous. Basically here it's speaking that there's no connection to the source of life. There's no roots in Christ. There can be no withstanding the judgment of God. And no sinner in the assembly of the righteous will be able to stand on the last day. 
Either our lives are transformed by the one who gave his life, by the righteous one of Israel who came and lived a perfect, holy, sinful, life, sinless life, who did meditate on God's law day and night, who did delight himself in the will of God, who did live righteously according to the law all of his life, and yet he laid down his life as a substitutionary offering so that the wicked, but, so that the wicked might have life might be connected to the source of life. You see, the reality in the room today, in case you haven't already noticed, Jesus is the protagonist of our story. He is the one to which Psalm 1 points to. He alone has delighted himself in the fullness of the law of God. He alone has kept in mind and in practice the law of the Lord. We are in our natural state. The wicked referred to here in our text. We have all walked in the counsel of the wicked. We have all stood in the way of sinners, and we have sat in the seat of mockers. Jesus alone is our source of life and connection to righteousness. John 15, Jesus said, I am the vine and you are the branches. If a man remains in me and I in him, he will bear much fruit. But apart from me, you can do nothing. For the skeptic in the room today, for the one who's been trying to accomplish the righteousness of God in their own strength, you desperately need to grasp hold and be connected to the source of life in the Lord Jesus. For the Christian in the room struggling, who seeks God and who trusts in his grace through, fra through faith in Christ's offering of death on the cross, taking on the wrath of God for us that we might obtain the righteousness of God through him. Listen, there is life inside of you, and that life wants to produce roots deep within the grounds of your life that can support and sustain the growth that is to come, the pain and the pressures you are experiencing in this current season of life are going to make the fruit and the produce of the harvest season seem so rewarding and so sweet. Other people are going to benefit from the experiences that you persevered through, and you'll be so rooted in your faith that no attack of the enemy, no any storm of this life can break you or misplace you. You will no longer see your obstacles as means to defeat you, but as opportunity to propel you deeper. You will begin to notice others experiencing the same same difficulties that you once faced and while you were under and you will no longer cower away in shame feeling inadequate or unequipped but you will you will feel empowered and inviting as you bring others in to find rest in the shade of your strong limbs and to feel refreshed by the sweet fruit of your harvest season trees not only provide for others but their fruit produces new growth all around them when the mighty oak tree begins to sprout acorns and they begin to fall to the ground each year, some of them find rich soil and take root and develop into new growth. Many of you are trying to kill off the pine saplings that keep growing in your yard every year. You understand this principle that the Christian life, man, is not meant for our, just ourselves. We are never meant to live a life of, 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 of seclusion or alone. We are always meant to live in community, and God has allowed these struggles and these difficulties and these afflictions in our lives that make us feel like we're going under to persevere that we might produce fruit so that other people's lives will be enriched by the testimony that God has built in us. Our planter has positioned us all. He has given us various seasons for planting, for growth, and for harvest. Our trees may look different. Our fields may be in different locations. Our circumstances and our conditions may vary. But we all have the life of the seed inside of us. For those of us who are in Christ, we have been planted in this life, and it's up to us whether or not we recognize and give honor to the ground we've been given and to trust the planter to tend to the seed that is within us. He who began a good work in us will see it to completion. For the one who's yet to transfer their trust in the finished work of Christ for salvation to give them right position before God, man, today is your day. Today is the day where you stop trusting in your own righteousness. You stop trusting in your own ability to do, to do good. You stop trusting in what the world classifies as good and you, you grab hold of the righteousness that comes only through Jesus Christ the only source of connection to life. Our great hope as Christians is not in this life. Our deep longing is not for this current world. We groan with all of creation, eagerly awaiting the redemption of our bodies, the new heaven, new earth. 
1 Corinthians, Paul wrote, When you sow, you do not plant the body that will be, but just the seed, perhaps of weed or of something else. But God gives it a body as he has determined. And to each kind of seed, he gives it its own body. It goes on to say, And so it will be with the resurrection of the dead. The body that is sown is perishable. It is raised imperishable. It is sown in dishonor. It is raised in glory. It is sown in weakness. It is raised in power. It is sown a natural body. It is raised a spiritual body. You know, the greatest fear amongst our society today, as experts say the number one fear in the world today is the fear of death, right, at, right in front of public speaking, right? The fear of death. And I believe the reason so many people fear death, number one, I think it's uncertain, it's unknown. But we get a lot, of, a lot of insight from Scripture. But I think people get a misconception of what death really is and why death has come into the world. We know the Bible says the punishment of sin is death. And we look back to the Garden of Eden when Adam and Eve sinned against God, they dishonored his command to eat from the tree, and God uh, banished them into exile from the garden, and death came upon all men, and we experienced death because of that, and we think it's a punishment for the sin of the original man. But man, I'm here today to tell you that, man, from a loving and holy father to Adam and Eve and to you and me in this life, we need not fear death. Death is not a punishment. The Bible says the punishment of sin is death, but the gift of God is eternal life. In Christ Jesus. Our Heavenly Father knew if He allowed Adam and Eve to reside in the garden, if He allowed them to eat from the tree of life, if He allowed them to do that, that they would forever be eternally in a broken state of relationship to Him. He knew that if they were to stay in their sin for all time, that they would not have the experience of a perfect, right relationship with Him like He created them to be. And for you and I, if we don't taste death in this life, Praise God if Jesus comes back before we do. I hope he does. But if he don't, if we are to face death in this life, if we are to come like the apostle Job who lost everything in the face of death said, Lord, though you slay me, still I will trust in you. Because he knew, he knew that in order for his life to be completely restored, in order for his relationship to God to be completely redeemed, in order for you and I to experience a life in un- unimpacted Fellowship with the Father like we were created to be. We know that it's not in this life. It's not in this world. Our hope is for new heaven, new earth. When our glorified bodies will be redeemed. When we're transformed and the body of sin is forever done away with. So no matter what this life throws at you, Christian, you are like a tree planted by streams of water whose leaves never wither and who always yields its fruit in due season. Never lose hope. Never give up faith. It's not over just because you feel under. Heavenly Father, we honor you in this house. God, you alone are our source of life. God, you have made a way for us to know you, to be restored, to be redeemed. God, by the blood of the Lamb. And Lord, I just thank you so much for every believer in this room. God, I pray that today we be encouraged by your word. Lord, that those who you have planted, Lord God, you will, you are the, the vineyard keeper. God, you will make sure that we produce fruit in our lives. God, you will prune us. God, you will pluck us. You will do whatever possible, Lord, to make sure that we are useful for your kingdom. So I pray for encouragement today for the one who feels like, man, they're struggling. They're having a hard time seeing how they're going to make it, how they're going to see it through. And Lord, for the one in the room maybe that's, kind of skeptical or on the fence, God, that has a hard time understanding what this is. God, I pray that your spirit would just breathe life into them, that today they would transfer their trust to the only place that can be connected to eternal life in your son. God, I thank you for this great family of believers. God, we pray for our pastor today, Lord, as he's sharing your word in Illinois to young people. I pray lives are changed. But God, in this moment, God, I pray your will be done. Your spirit would move in our midst, that you would be glorified. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen.